I don't believe entrepreneurs are born or made. I think there are certain characteristics that entrepreneurs have that when nurtured turn into wonderful new ventures. I believe that we can map a broad territory for what entrepreneurial pathways will help you create that new venture. And that is what this lecture is all about. So, what does entrepreneurship mean to you? It's important for you to impose your per personal perspective on what entrepreneurship is. Entrepreneurship is a lot about communicating your vision. But your vision about what? My definition is clearly bolded in the important words. Thinking and acting. Not thinking or acting. Not acting then thinking. It is thinking and acting, but thinking and acting about what? Opportunities. I often uh, talk about this definition to people and those who are in the psychiatry or psychology field uh, will criticize me for using the word obsessed. Well, that's exactly what I mean. Obsessed about opportunities in everything you do. So you're thinking and acting about an opportunity or opportunities all the time, but not just the opportunity in some narrow sense, but in a broad, holistic approach. And it's your responsibility to be the leader in creating a balance and understanding in a more three-dimensional way about what that opportunity is. And for what reason? do we pursue on entrepreneurship? For what reason do we become entrepreneurs? And at some, to some extent, the end of this de definition, for the purpose of value creation and capture, is at times controversial. But I think it begs two questions. What is value and for whom? So when you're talking about your opportunity, you have to talk about what the value you are going to create for the key stakeholders. Please remember that. There are issues involved with my definition of entrepreneurship, and I want to share them with you. I've talked about the obsessed word, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. Great entrepreneurs know when to move along, when to change direction. Obsessed doesn't mean having blinders on. The capturing of value for some folks in some ways means a lack of commitment it's not what I mean I mean it is an absolute commitment to deliver on the value and to deliver the value that you are promising to the individual stakeholders what is value is again a really important question for some people financial value is greed understand what the sh what the stakeholder expects and you reduce risk now i don't think you need to have a new technology to um, to deliver i think uh, i think you can do it with new or cheaper products and services sometimes a delivery system is implied is a, uh, a new technology. There are a lot of contradictions. There are a lot of stress points in entrepreneurship. If you understand that most people will not have a perfect balance between their opportunity obsession and their need for detail, but it is that in that tension that an individual, and I think more importantly a team, can really develop the kinds of stresses that build good entrepreneurship muscle. So looking for the, the balance between spontaneity, oppor opportunism, and discipline and processes, I think that's where the real value can come in the long run and again in the development. 
At the heart of the entrepreneurial process is opportunity recognition. But be careful. Ideas are a dime a dozen. There are millions of ideas that aren't good opportunities. How do we start to frame? How do we start to get a territory into which we can begin an investigation? What are the parameters to separate an idea from a real opportunity? The key, the first one, is market demand. Can we really understand who needs this product or service? How many of them are there? What is the real growth potential of this? And is it lasting? Now, I use the word durable. And when I ask people what that means, they usually say something like, well, sustainable or, or it'll last. But for how long? Go back to the definition your stakeholders have of value. Can you produce value within the time frame they believe is important? For venture capitalists, that's pretty easy. Four to seven years, 25 to 40 percent internal rate of return annualized. For others, it may be more difficult. The better your opportunity is at matching the value creation requirements of the stakeholders, the lower your risk. Now, the quicker you identify and can reach that customer, and the better mechanisms by which you reach that customer, embed a high potential opportunity. Remember the, uh, I think it was Thoreau, who said, if you build a better mousetrap, uh, the world will be the path to your door, or some such phrase. Well, if you knew it, or if you know it, try to forget it. Wonderful poetry, terrible entrepreneurship. If you build a better mousetrap, you better start working on the road. You should have some maps and signs. You might want to hire a taxi cab to take them there. Understand how you're going to reach that customer. And over what period of time will I deliver value? Now, if the customer believes they're receiving value in under a year, well, that's a pretty clear value proposition and it reduces risk. That sometimes, especially in student uh, businesses, can lead to t-shirt businesses. Clear transaction. If you're building a jet engine, it will take longer. The longer it takes to deliver on customer payback, to, to really fulfill that customer proposition, then the greater the risk. This all talks about really understanding who your primary target are. The second key category for opportunity recognition, market size and structure. Remember, what we're trying to do is increase the size and potential of your deal while at the same time decreasing the risk. High impact ventures. That's what changes the world. That's what really creates wealth. So the market size and structure are really important. How big is this market? And how is it currently formed? Emerging and or fragmented is rich entrepreneurial territory. Think of some examples of an emerging industry. Mobile communication, clearly emerging, maybe less fragmented, uh, but still at some level fragmented. Those, that territory gives you rising market demand and no dominant player to which you have to compete. Also, what are the proprietary barriers to entry? It's a double-edged sword. The fewer the proprietary barriers, the easier for you to enter. The sooner you can build proprietary barriers, the, the better your protection will be. And is there an existing level of market demand with a large upside potential? Existing market demand tells me that there is clearly an audience that will take this. If I do something better in this industry, I can then follow the rising tide of that demand into a big market. Again, risk-reducing behavior. All of that speaks to really understanding market metrics. In, in a more textured fashion than just what you can get out of a library, by the way. Let's look at the life cycle of a business from startup or even pre-startup to a, a more mature or stable uh, phase. 
That space that we outline in the high growth period, that's called the window of opportunity. That's because if I can enter when there's some existing market demand at a point at which the ascension of that curve is the greatest, I have the greatest opportunity to get market share and establish some dominance. Now, if I had my druthers, I would probably exit at the highest point. I don't know any business that could really calculate that in, in advance, but understanding that territory helps in decision making. Let's talk about some of the issues involved in opportunity recognition. Remembering that opportunity recognition and opportunity shaping are bedfellows. So when there is an issue, we might be able to deal with that in shaping the opportunity or understanding the balance of risk and return. Good science connected to a market demand has lower risk. Good science unconnected to market demand may still be a great product or service, but with higher risk. So is the market large enough and is the opportunity big enough for me to accept that risk? Question you need to answer. I've certainly learned that invention and innovation are different. But innovation, invention can become innovation, especially when it's connected to demand through design. That user interface mentality is important to connecting invention to a market that needs it. Now we've talked about technology versus t-shirts. and typically is a time to market and therefore a cost issue increasing the risk does it increase the return I've never seen a product or service that didn't have some competitor money is placed somewhere customers that you garner need to reallocate resources even if it's from a bank account to your product you have to deal with the value proposition and the competitive structure. Now, I've seen many a student, many a business plan, many a business that thought the spreadsheet was the business plan. It is not. And the key to any spreadsheet, and the key to margins, is really disciplined assumptions. Really articulating clearly on what assumptions do you base your numbers. You know, and if at the end of the process it's not an opportunity, then walk away. You've saved yourself a lot of pain, but you've probably learned a lot. But also, if you clearly articulate the flaws and you don't kid yourself, you have a bigger chance to shape it and make that opportunity really work. Let's look at the third aspect of opportunity recognition. Your actions, your competitive advantage, should manifest in some margin. So if you have a machine that can produce a widget better than anyone else, show me the gross margin. If you have found a better way to get something done, maybe you need less capital and therefore can get a bigger return for lower dollars. And if you can articulate when you can get to break even so that your investors know that there is oxygen going to be pumped in through the venture, then you have a better chance of really succeeding. Then you have really discussed how the competitive advantage will manifest in a financial return. If you can't articulate that, chances of getting venture money, be it through a formal venture capital or angels or other places, is dramatically reduced. And frankly, you ought to reconsider your understanding of that opportunity. Someone comes to you and says, I have a great idea. Your first thought should be, is it an opportunity? And of course, they're going to say yes. So you then have to say, 
Talk to me about market demand. Explain to me the market size and potential and current structure of the industry. And how do your competitive advantages manifest in a, a better margin? That's the three M's of opportunity recognition. Once you believe you have an opportunity, then you need to understand and use resources. What is necessary for me to really implement this idea, this opportunity, but not be driven by resources? Be driven by the nature of the opportunity. What is the cash? What is the creative acquisition of resources? And what are the total resources I'll need to really get this off the ground. Now, to get it off the ground, to get it launched into the trajectory that we believe is appropriate to capture the opportunity under the opportunity assessment criteria we talked about, the lesson I teach and the one that most people forget is to minimize and control versus maximize and own resources. If you can have fewer resources that you can control, the chance of you delivering on value to your stakeholder is enhanced over those who try to maximize or own resources. It is the most creative part of the entrepreneurial process that I have seen. Finding ideas, there are a million of them, and we can get you to the point of being really good at understanding the difference between an idea and a real opportunity. But really figuring out creatively how to garner the resources in the most economical way by minimizing and controlling versus maximizing and owning, that's real creativity. To help you with that, I would ask you to think cash last. That means if I need a resource, how do I get that resource without asking for a check? Now the reality is you're going to ask for some checks and you're probably going to need some cash to deliver on this. But can I do that as a last resort while I have really exhausted all my creative power in gaining resources? Oftentimes, that means some bootstrapping. All the time, that usually means you have to have a relationship. Let's look at some of the issues involving resources. I think there is a dark side to entrepreneurship in that you can get too focused on a financial return. And you can kid yourself about delivering value to other people and really believe I'm delivering value to me. And that can be a problem. And we need to stomp that out every time we see it and, and work against any of that instinct. I would recommend you draw a line and say, I am absolutely committed and this is how I'm going to uh, deal with my stakeholders and you don't cross that. In my course, we use cases all the time to test those boundaries and ask you to create your understanding of what your personal line in the sand is. You also need to understand the capital market's food chain. Um, if you deliver on value, you build a reputation of being honest and being competent. And once you do that, the ability to garner resources and to get investment capital can be quite substantial. That requires a longer term view. Those with a longer term view who live a life as an entrepreneur can create amazing amount of value. Now in this whole discussion we've talked about opportunity being the most important part at the center of entrepreneurship. So why do I now say the key ingredient for success is an entrepreneurial team? The ample answer is pretty simple. People, quality people, a quality team makes better decisions and shapes opportunity. In a dynamic environment, the shaping of opportunity is a constant effort. And a quality team will 
understand great opportunities, shape great opportunities, and execute on great opportunities. Now, how do we begin to identify what a team is? Relevant experience makes a difference. One of the key bits of relevant experience is, have they done this before? And if they've done this before, have they excelled? Have they, have they done a startup? Have they done a profit center? Have they had sales responsibility? Have they managed people? There are very few perfect entrepreneurs, so we move through the chain of experience. Commitment for an entrepreneur is having skin in the game. Are they risking something, and sometimes their own money and career and psyche, to be a part of this venture? And because things are so rapidly changing, there will be great ambiguity and uncertainty, especially in a new venture, but frankly, in most ventures now. What is their tolerance for risk? And have they creatively marshaled resources in the past, either in a new venture or an existing company or in other kinds of organizations? Probing the issue of creative resource allocation is an interesting exercise. I love talking about team locus of control. It is not centered on the individual, it's centered on the idea and the opportunity and the team believes they are responsible for delivering on it. No matter what happens, good or bad, the team takes credit or takes blame. And that means you better be adaptable. And are you comfort comfortable with that adaptability. And I guess I have obsessively talked about opportunity obsession, but boy, if you can have individuals that come together as a team, understand the opportunity recognition and shaping criteria and refine it, that's a heck of a team. And when people take responsibility for outcomes, they tend to be leaders. If that leadership around the opportunity is communicated among the team and to the stakeholders and to the broader audience, chances of success are increased. I don't know what passion is until I see those kinds of characteristics bundled into a team, then I understand it. Let's talk about some of the issues in developing an entrepreneurial team. The soft side is sometimes difficult for people to understand and even more difficult to teach. It is particularly hard for those folks who are rooted in the hard sciences to put an equal amount of emphasis on the soft side. Here's where I think having engineering entrepreneurs talk about the soft side is important to understanding those issues. Um, most will say they wish they did more with human resource management and with knowledge of human resources uh, than they did in their undergraduate work or even graduate work, in that really learning those skills were intimately important. And I think, you know, you go back to the, some of the contradictions uh, and conflicts uh, in, in entrepreneurship, I think there is a balance between the, the hard, scientific, factually based uh, due diligence and action and management and the softer, less calculable pieces of it. There is a balance and those who get the balance win the game. Over the years I have uh, begun creating a list of the kinds of characteristics you need and it's, it's a lot of fun to start to list some of these. And I would love to get emails from anyone who had a characteristic uh, in a similar kind of uh, description. Uh, remember, it's not important to be perfect. It's important to always be working to get better. Now let's talk about putting all this together in a very simple but I think elegant model. Jeffrey Timmons was a great entrepreneurship educator and co-author of several books with me and in a lot of ways uh, and a very important uh, personal and professional mentor. 
And he would talk about starting with opportunity and understanding the size and shape and color and texture and balance of that opportunity and going through the recognition and shaping process. And then finding a team that can really execute and really blend and really communicate the nature of that opportunity who have the skills and the understanding of value definitions. And when you have those two, if you match that with minimized and controlled resources, then you really have an opportunity to build a business plan that is well connected now and holistic in nature. Now, look at this. There are dotted lines. There is permeability. There is no perfection. And that's where risk comes in. But it creates a business plan that has both fits and gaps and we understand both and we work at making it better all the time and tightening those dotted lines and making them as close as we can to solid knowing we'll never get there and trying to understand the competitive forces around us that are always pounding away at our opportunity. Now look at the team at the base of this model. A lot of people are uncomfortable that this triangle is upside down and on a wheel. Well, it's hard to balance. Think of yourself and that team as balancing those resources and opportunity. As the opportunity gets bigger, you need more resources. If it becomes constrained, then you have to shrink the resources. And the same thing with the team. It is balance that you seek in this, and it is a never-ending responsibility. Much of what we talk about in the Timmons model and in entrepreneurship is in the management, education, and literature today but it is how we put those components together, how we holistically shape this, that I think is important. I think we've made some real mistakes. In many places, we start thinking in terms of budget or resources, and then we look for people in a hierarchical environment to help us manage that budget, so we establish a firm base. And we draw very hard lines in organizational charts and around responsibilities, and then we end up, what invention can we turn into an opportunity? Same components, different configuration, much different outcomes. I would suggest we've begun to look at what entrepreneurship is and where the territory lies. I would ask you to reflect on the three M's, to define your own personal goals, to think about the Timmins model and how you might use that, and to begin to explore your territory and what your boundaries are. This is the beginning of a lifelong journey.